Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're excited to have you uh, with us and our guest today, Dr. Chanina Loema. And uh, this is uh, another one of our webinar series in, um, in our spring and summer series. And today we'll be talking about American Indian boarding school stories from the 19th and 20th centuries. And I just wanna um, real briefly introduce myself for those of you who haven't joined our webinars before and go over some of our logistics for the interface that we're using today, go to, go to webinar. Um, so Dina Way Magani Duke, that's greetings my relatives. I am Christine Dindisi McCleave. I'm the executive officer for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. And I am from Turtle Mountain, North Dakota. I'm Ojibwe, and uh, the Boarding School Healing Coalition is officed in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So that's where um, that's where I am, and that's where Rose, our program manager, is, and uh, she's also on the screen here. And um, we'll introduce our guest speaker for today in just a moment. But I just wanted to go over the, some of the webinar logistics. So. Um, when you logged in, you should be um, seeing an interface, a panel on your right hand side of your screen that um, tells you you're in listen only mode. Um, it does have a chat feature and a question feature so that um, if you have questions, you can go ahead and type those in as you um, as you think of them as our speaker is talking and um, Rose Myron will go ahead and facilitate the Q&A at the end of our, um, our talk. And we're gonna go ahead and administer a poll through that um, right-hand panel. And we're gonna ask who is on the webinar today. So if you could go ahead and answer um, the poll that is being administered right now. Uh, the first question is um, who's on the panel or who's I'm sorry who's on the webinar and the second question um, that we'll go ahead and administer also right now is um, what sector you're from so what your interest in this webinar is um, are you in education in academia are you in um, social work or behavioral health do you work at a tribe? So go ahead and answer those and then um, we're gonna have Rose tell us about who is on the webinar. Great, so I'm just launching that second poll now. Um, and I will see the first poll, we had um, almost everybody vote. It looks like we have a couple of boarding school survivors on the line and then about half of you are descendants of a boarding school student, uh, and about half are neither a boarding school survivor or a descendant. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you. Yes, and um, we did this poll on one of our previous webinars, and then we had a couple webinars where we did not administer that poll. And it sounds like the results are very similar. Um, so it may be some of the same people joining in. So if, if that is true, thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right, do we have uh, a and then it looks like, Yeah, yep, so it looks like we're almost split in thirds. About a third of people are um, joining us from tribal services or Indian, urban Indian health services. About a third are from academia or education, and about a third are from other. All right. Maybe next time we'll try to find out what the other is. If you could, if you were one of the people who said other, can you go ahead and use the, um, the chat feature to send to our organizer what um, what your other sector was. We were limited in the number of responses that we could enter um, with the polling feature, so uh, but we'd still like to know where you're calling in from, so thanks. Um, okay, so real quickly, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is a 501c3 nonprofit. We were started in 2012. The Native American Rights Fund was our fiscal sponsor until 2015. And um, we are a coalition of um, Native individuals, tribes and tribal organizations, as well as our allies, uh, non-Native individuals and non-Native organizations. We are 100% uh, Native American Board of Directors and Executive Staff. So um, it's free to join if, for individuals. If you wanna go ahead and check out our website, boardingschoolhealing.org, 
um, we'd love for you to join the coalition. Our vision is restoring indigenous cultural sovereignty and our mission is to lead in the pursuit of understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma created by the US Indian boarding school policy. And today we have uh, with us Dr. Sanina Loema, and uh, she is a professor in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. Dr. Loema has been a scholar of indigenous studies since earning her PhD in 1987 from Stanford University. Her scholarship on the federal off-reservation boarding school system is rooted in the experiences of her father, Curtis Thorpe Carr, a survivor of Chilaco Indian Agricultural School in Oklahoma, where he was enrolled from 1927 to 1935. And her books include To Remain an Indian, Lessons for Democracy for, from a Century of Native American Education, Uneven Ground and American Indian Sovereignty and Federal Law, Away from Home, an American Indian Boarding School Experience, and they called it Prairie Light, the story of Chilaco Indian School. So um, with that, we give a warm welcome and we hand it over to you, Dr. Luema. Thank you. Thank you. Well, th many thanks um, to Christine McCleave and to Rose Myron of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. And a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today. Um, as Christine mentioned, I'm Chanina Lamawaima, and I'm speaking to you today as uh, both a historian of the federal Indian school system and also as the daughter of a survivor. And that's my dad, you see on the left there, Curtis Thorpe Carr, um, in his high school graduation picture, although it was, it was not from Shalako, he ran away uh, before he finished high school there. Um, on the right, you see his older brother, Bob, um, Robert Carlisle Carr, in a photograph that was taken, I think, um, about 1926 or 1927, uh, possibly quite soon before the boys were sent to Shilako. This is the very first building uh, that was built in 1884. At that time, it housed everything, uh, teachers' quarters, classrooms, the dining hall, the student dormitories, but by 1927, it was called Home 2, and it housed uh, the younger or the smaller boys, and that blue arrow that you see points to the room where Kurt and Bob slept when they first arrived at Shilako. Uh, Kurt was nine, and Bob was 10, going on 11. So I wanna to start today uh, with one of my dad's boarding school stories. Squirrels, my dad once told me, love hard candy. So at Shalako in the spring, the boys would climb up into big shaggy nests of leaves swaying at the top of the tallest trees, and they would capture baby squirrels for pets. In Oklahoma, there's a semi-rare black variety of squirrel, and my dad, Kurt, and his best friend, Charlie, were the squirrel-holding elite at Shalako because they knew where the black squirrel nests were and they always had black squirrels for pets. And that made them special. Your special was not something that most Indian children attending a federal Indian boarding school ever heard. After all, these institutions were designed to tell them how not special they were. Every hour of every day, of every week, of every year spent away from home and family. I'm sure you're wondering what kind of candy do squirrels love? All day suckers, they were called, hard and shiny as glass. My dad said, the little squirrel curled up in my shirt pocket during the day and slept, and every so often, he'd poke his head out and demand a broken up piece of all day sucker. And I wonder, what did that feel like? The warm young squirrel curled up in the shirt pocket over his heart. You couldn't keep them, he said. After all, squirrels are wild animals and you can't really tame them. 
And so the day would come when the squirrels were ready to go, and the boys always let them go back to the tall trees in the Catalpa Grove or along Shalako Creek. And I wonder, was that part of the appeal to be a temporary squirrel holder for a few weeks out of the long year and to let the squirrel go free? Squirrels, my dad said, love hard candy. And my dad loved candy too, especially chocolate covered cherries. And I wonder growing up in an institution like this, when exactly did my dad first taste a chocolate covered cherry? Now, it may seem to you that a question about chocolate covered cherries might be an odd place to start a talk about the Indian school system. But the question rises up out of my dad's stories and lately how I've been thinking and feeling about them. The entertaining childhood stories that my dad told my sister and me, I believe carry deep lessons about growing up in a federal Indian boarding school. So how did Kurt get to Shilako? In the 1920s, a judge in Wichita, Kansas, decided that my grandmother was not competent to raise her three children. She was, after all, a native woman on her own, no husband, and that was enough. So my dad was nine years old, as I mentioned in 1927, when the court sent him and Bob to Shilako. And Kurt didn't see his mom again, until he was, um, I think, 14, 15 years old when he went AWOL or absent without leave. And he ran away at that time because he wanted to see his mother again. So I mentioned earlier that Shalaka was built in 1884. At that time, it was enrolling children from the then very recently hostile Comanche, Kiowa, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes. During the 20th century, though, enrollment expanded to include more than 45 tribes from across Oklahoma uh, and the American Southwest. At its height in the Depression years, Shilako enrolled about 1,000 to 1,200 students a year. Now, after World War II, those enrollments declined. Um, in the 1950s and 1960s, Shilako enrolled many Diné students, Navajo students from the Southwest. And then in the 1960s, through um, its closing, there were many Native Alaskan students who were brought to school here. Shilako closed in 1980, and the campus is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, although that is no protection against the heavy hand of time. And many of the buildings are quite literally uh, disintegrating. Now, I made a note on this slide about the Browning ruling to remind us that many federal powers over Indian people have not been legislated by Congress as law. They've been imposed by bureaucrats, by employees of the office, later Bureau of Indian Affairs. And that is really, really important. That many of these powers asserted over native families have not been legislated. That means they've not been even reviewable by the courts. They've operated quite literally outside the law. Many children taken away from their families to boarding schools were removed on the basis of bureaucratic orders like the Browning ruling. And so in that respect, um, Kurt and Bob's experience being placed there by court order was a little out of the norm. Indian boarding school stories raise some hard questions. How and what do we remember? Who and what might we forget? And how do we honor those who survived as well as those who did not? And how might we accomplish something like healing? 
The stories I believe are key. Indian boarding school stories are inspiring, frequently funny, nearly always heartbreaking. They ignite raucous laughter as well as build tears. Stories are kept to oneself. Stories are sometimes never ever told. Stories nestle in a pocket over our heart until the day they stick their head out and demand a piece of all day sucker. Feed me, remember me, think about me, tell me. So at this point I need to make a confession. Um, the title of the webinar today is a little misleading because the stories I'm gonna to share today are all from the early 20th century. But I do wanna to bring to your attention um, the best memoir I know of 19th century boarding school life, The Middle Five, which was written by Francis LaFleche, Omaha. Um, LaFleche attended a Presbyterian mission school that was built near his home village uh, in what's now Nebraska. Uh, a place he attended, whoops, in the 1870s. And LaFleche had this remarkable talent, writing as an adult, to recreate from a child's eye view a vision of this, this strange and new institution, uh, the mission school. Now, LaFleche and his experiences in the 1870s bear marked similarities to what happened at Shalako in the early 20th century. All the Indian schools really, whether run by churches or the federal government, were characterized by strict military discipline, English only, language policies, uh, a blanket hostility toward native religious or social life, and pretty rudimentary academic training with a major emphasis on menial labor uh, in the home and on the farm. So just a note here that the slides you're gonna see today, uh, many of them come from Shalako. These are all slides, photos from Shalako, but there's also pictures, photos, historic photos mixed in from other schools. Um, I don't have pictures of everything from Shalako and there is a lot of similarity across the various schools. It can be challenging, of course, to recover children's stories from the boarding schools, especially in the early days, but it's remarkable, really, how much is accessible through the National Archives, in letters, and memoirs like La Flesche's. For example, Shalaka was built in 1884, graduated its first class, you see them here, in 1894. And in 1910, school authorities wrote to the members of this first graduating class, inviting them to the 1910 graduation ceremonies. And one of those alums, a young woman, responded in a letter. Yes, I graduated from Shalako after completing about seventh grade work. There had to be a first graduating class, and unfortunately, mine was the one. Shalako has my gratitude for her training in the sewing room, assistant matron's work, and about three good years of solid classroom work, and this out of eight years attendance. Five years of important foundation work were practically lost due to incompetent primary teachers. I'm sorry I cannot credit Shalako with my success, such as it is, but it is my policy to take the bull by the horns and give credit where it is due. With best wishes for a successful commencement and pleasant vacations to all. Her sweetly sarcastic letter sums up some of the important ways that daily practices at the schools did not match up to policymakers' rhetoric. Policy rhetoric would have us believe that these schools were designed to create assimilated, self-sufficient, independent workers ready to take their place in American society on an equal footing. 
This writer points out the academic, very low academic expectations of Indian students and the poor quality of teachers in these rural, isolated, and quite underfunded schools. Now, not all alumni took such a negative view of Shalako. And I think this is the most important lesson of boarding school stories. Thousands, thousands of Indian individuals attended these schools across the country, across time, more than a century. And they were individuals. They came from different backgrounds before school. They had different experiences in school. And they tell us different stories. Also in 1910, Max Satima, a Hopi alum, who I think was struggling to adjust uh, to make the transition back home from Shalako to Keems Canyon Agency, where he worked as an interpreter, he also wrote a letter in 1910 to Shalako. He wrote, I am trying my best to please my employer, and I, I hope he realizes it. I'm trying to get some turkeys for my Thanksgiving dinner. I wish I would be to Shalako to get some of those nice things. How is everybody at Shalako? I hope fine. Love to everybody. I remain yours truly. Mac's letter provides touching insights into how students could be impacted by years away from home. Children are impressionable. It, it should come as no surprise to us that schools were successful to varying degrees in changing the ways Indian children and Indian people lived their lives day to day, what they wore, what they ate. Well, what about Shalako in the 1920s and 1930s? In 1984, I interviewed my dad and about 60 other Shalako alums, most of whom had attended sometime between 1920 and 1940. Their stories recount terrific homesickness, resilient adaptation, resistance to authority and alliance with authority, dedication to each other, enduring bonds of friendship, and much more. And they also vividly illustrate the slippages between federal policy and practice, between the rhetoric and the reality of boarding schools. Now, remember that rhetoric about the schools producing independent, self-sufficient citizens? Here's what a Shalako alum who started school in 1929 had to say about that. Um, this is a Cherokee woman speaking. You got up early in the morning and got dressed, went down in the basement and had roll call and marched to the dining room. And then from the dining room, you marched to your rooms and then went on your way. There were schedules all over the place. You had to have a schedule. You never would know where you were supposed to be. It was very hard when I left there because there were no schedules. There were no bells ringing and no whistles blowing. And I didn't know what to do. That, that was one of the big complaints that I heard from kids who left Shalako, especially if they spent a lot of years there. Now Florence, who's Choctaw, entered Shalako in 1933. She was in the ninth grade. She took a very similarly analytical view of the daily practices of the school. And this is what she had to say. One thing that I think figures in prominently into this lack of warmth that I'm talking about is the loss of individuality. That comes from that damn GI issue, striped denim drawers, gray sweaters. If we we're gonna have sweaters, why did they all have to be gray? In that cold climate, you know, that was just some kind of the things. Well, it was just, I guess, some kind of a feeling on the part of the people who controlled the purse strings to encourage submission. I don't know what else to call it. Now, training in trades was a very important part of Indian school life. 
but it was often overshadowed by the daily menial labor that students put in just to keep the schools going. Boys and girls were kept strictly segregated until the 1930s, at least, in the dorms, dining hall, classrooms, and in their work assignments. Girls worked in the kitchen, but the bakery, because it was of commercial scale, that was considered a trade for the boys. And Charlie, who came to Shilako in 1934, in the, also in the ninth grade, recalls this about the bakery. On the days that we were working in the bakery instead of going to school in the morning, each one of us, one of us would get up at three o'clock in the morning, go down, mix up about 400 pounds of flour, mix the dough for the bread that day, put it in a trough and let it be rising. When we all got there about eight o'clock, was ready to work up and make into bread. And so we made all the cakes, pies, rolls, what have you, during the day. We fed those thousand students, and we learned a lot of skills, too. Like when I was going to college, I did some baking to supplement my income. And I worked two years in between college, too. By the time they were seniors, they could pretty well supervise, lead the younger ones. And that was the way it was in all the shops. The younger ones learned from the older ones whether it be carpenter, baker, or candlestick maker. Florence remembers some of the girls' work details. I remember learning to darn socks on a light bulb, which I have never done since. I don't think there was anything really for the girls expected to develop into a trade. No, I think at the time it was just, you're a woman, you're going to be a wife learned to patch and sew and darn. I got pretty adept at making pillowcases. We really did things that were used there. I think I spent half a semester hemming dish towels and I graduated to pillowcases. I don't think I ever got beyond pillowcases. In reality, submission to authority was more important than the details of laundry, needlework, or food preparation. In 1938, in order to graduate, a student had to demonstrate vocational achievement, complete all their projects, remove any Fs or incompletes from their grade record, and then the rules spelled out, quote, the student whose record is not satisfactory as to personal conduct will not be recommended for graduation, end quote. So school employees, and you see some of the teachers in the lower right-hand photograph in this slide, they controlled a lot of student life, but they could not control everything. And private moments outside their surveillance fill treasured memories of boarding school life. Students organized themselves into a society of their own creation. And a Creek woman who came to Shilako at age 18 in 1934, she remembers how she learned the student rules. I was assigned for my first detail in the kitchen. I weighed 87 pounds and was five foot. My detail was to cook the oatmeal every morning for 900 students. The cook, realizing I was quite short, built a stool so I could stand on that and stir the large wooden ladle. My job also was to wash the pot after breakfast. One day I climbed up on my stool to wash the pot and one of the older girls took that stool away while I was perched with my stomach balanced on the edge of the pot. And then she gently pushed me in. I did not call out, I did not cry. I found my way out, tied a tea towel around my hair and asked the cook, could I go back to my dorm room? She took that towel off my head and asked, what happened to you? I told her, oh, I slipped. I slipped and fell into the pot. From then on, my days on that detail were different. I guess I was accepted into the larger and more controlling group. And of course, even at home, there was a pecking order among five children. So Marion learned the rules that way. Among the boys, Membership in a gang was really necessary for mutual protection. 
and for comforting friendship, the gangs really were a kind of family. Remember the title of Francis LaFleche's book, The Middle Five? That was the name of his gang at that Presbyterian mission school. My dad, Kurt, fondly remembered those times of comradeship. He recalled, we even built little dugouts along the side of the steep creek banks where the water didn't come up anymore, dig out a place, put a roof over it and saw it over it, and have a little place that we could be on our own. Even one year, we tore down one of the old buildings, nothing but junk lumber they were going to burn anyway. We took that down in the woods and built a little shack, filled the loft in the fall with walnuts, even had a little pot-bellied stove in there. And we would go down in the wintertime and crack walnuts and sit in the warm shack. So there were a lot of little things that other kids never had who grew up otherwise. And these things I remember with great fondness. They'd have stomp dances out at night in the early years. They'd build a fire and parch corn and then make little drums out of tin cans with rubber stretched over the top. And they'd, they'd have stomp dances out there at night. And it was a lot of fun. Boarding school stories tell us many things. Shalako did a lot of damage. But it also became home to hundreds, thousands of Indian children who are smart, resourceful, resilient, dedicated to one another, and much more than just victims. Their stories of friendship, laughter, even happiness occasionally carved out of the institutional life of Shalako deserve our respect and attention. They have something to say. Some valued their education in the highest degree. Some look back with regret, resentment, even anger, but everyone who attended Shalako took something immutable and everlasting with them. Might have been friendships that lasted a lifetime, might have been a spouse, a trade that provided employment, or a self-reliance they achieved in spite of the regimentation. I believe there's a moral to the story of Shalako, and it falls somewhere between the depiction of boarding schools is irredeemably destructive and the sentiments of some alums that Shalako really was a wonderful place and a marvelous school. The moral is that no institution is total, no power is all seeing, no federal policy has ever been translated into practice efficiently or effectively and a lot of times the consequences weren't even on the radar. We must not, however, confuse that moral of an internally complex and contradictory institution with individual reality. For some students, Shalako was irredeemably destructive. It was fatal. And for some, it was marvelous. The fact, though, that some alumni value their experience at Shalako or some experiences does not mean that they or we should endorse its full policy and practice. Student survival and resilience does not justify the premises that the schools were designed to achieve, which was the goal of eliminating the native. So I need to circle back around to where this story today began and answer the question, what happened to Bob? Dad went to Shalaka with his older brother, Bob, and that's them in the photo with, um, on the left, a neighbor girl, he never could remember her name, and then Bob in the middle is cradling the cheeks of their younger sister, Betty. Bob, my dad said, was a pretty ordinary guy. And of all the frequently repeated and uh, you know often funny stories 
that our dad told us over the years. He only told us Bob's story once or twice. We remembered it. One day, Bob said, I'm sorry, one day, Dad said, Bob got to teasing one of the mules that we used to plow. And the mules being too smart to put up with that kind of nonsense, this one kicked Bob in the head and laid him out cold. He was never the same after that. He turned nasty mean, and about 1928 or 1929, he was expelled for, from Shalako for what they called incorrigible behavior, which, believe you me, was quite an accomplishment in those days. As a scholar, I've focused on these boarding schools, and I have to echo my dad. Very few children escape by being expelled. Dad never talked much about Bob, who died young while being incarcerated at the state prison in Lansing, Kansas. My dad told lots of stories about Shalako, though. I mean, it was, after all, as tough a place as it was, the place where he grew up. My dad's stories were central to that book that I wrote about Shalako. But four years after the book was published, I realized I had never even named Bob. I mean, I knew he was there, but I helped make him into a ghost. But Bob occupied a place in the history of Shalako, in the structure of my family, in the heart mind and experiences of my dad, to be sure. My dad's brother's name was Robert Carlisle Carr. And my dad continued the story. After Shalako, Bob did bad things. I always felt like our mom liked him best, though, maybe because of the way I looked. I asked our mom once, what did our dad look like? And she told me, you see a man walking down the streets of Wichita and he looks exactly like you? That's your dad. When Bob got sick at prison, they sent him to the hospital in Kansas City. And when he died, our mom really wanted to know what happened. So she asked me to go and find out. I went from Wichita, I was just a teenager myself, and I found the doctors in Kansas City but they wouldn't talk to me, just an Indian kid. What did they care? They said something about a rare blood disease, but who knows? Well, death is the ultimate erasure. The logic of the elimination of the native run to its limit. And the stories of loved ones lost to us are the most tragic boarding school stories. They remind us of our responsibility to remember and to honor all of our loved ones who pass through the halls of Shalako or other schools. And remembering can be a tricky business. It matters what and whom we remember, what we choose to remember, and what and whom we might forget. Thousands of young people move through Shalako over the decades, and so there must be hundreds, thousands of stories that might be told. This last story stands out in my memory as deeply illuminating about Shalako's student life. Now, the boys' world was ruled by the disciplinarians, men charged with their surveillance and control of over 400 young Indian boys, teenagers, and young men. And the need to control sorted students into military companies and house them in numbered dormitories. Shalako embodied the school as prison, and the disciplinarians were in the guard towers, sometimes literally. This is Harry S. Keller, the disciplinarian from home too. The boys called him the Black Panther because he stalked them. He'd climb up that water tower with his binoculars and spy across the fields, pastures, creek and catalpa grove where the boys sought a few hours of refuge 
in those few free Saturday hours. Now, school employees were required to live on school grounds. And Keller, the Black Panther, lived in one of the employee cottages. One warm summer evening, Keller hosted a garden party. Picnic tables piled high with food, strings of Japanese lanterns draped across the tree branches. It was Saturday night. And so the boys, they had had all day to plan their mischief. Pranks, practical jokes, sabotage, they used to flout authority. What Shalako boys and girls called tricksing. Now, Shalako was an agricultural school, so 8,000 acres, generating needed revenue to keep the schools going. Congressional appropriations were never enough. They had a large cattle herd, turkey and chicken flocks, fruit orchards, grain fields, and pastures. And the boys plowed those fields behind draft horse and plow mule teams. Shalaka was a federal facility, so it received supplies, cast off uniforms, hard tack rations and the like from the US military. And recently, the U.S. Cavalry had retired a small herd of horses to Shalako. The boys seized the opportunity. It was late on a Saturday night. My dad's gang of mixed blood Creek and Cherokee troublemakers climbed out a window of home too, and they snuck out to the pasture. The boys all loved to ride, but those draft horses and plow mules were no fun, but strong, fast cavalry horses. That was a mighty temptation, my dad remembered. They had just received these cavalry horses, so we decided we we're gonna check those horses out that night. We went out and caught some of these horses and one of them apparently had been a troop leader's horse. Could not stand to be behind other horses, but. We didn't know that yet. So one guy got on that horse, we got on the others and started off down the road. I happened to pass the troop leader's horse and that horse just immediately took off and the guy couldn't hold him. The horse took off and we were all helter skelter right behind him. Right across the dam on the lake straight up by the gymnasium and Keller's house was right next to the gymnasium on the corner. Here we came thundering by the gymnasium and this horse was going just wild. The guy couldn't turn him. Keller's house was right at the bend and that horse went right straight through that backyard and we were right behind him. They're all cavalry horses, jumping is nothing to them. They went right over the tables. The Japanese lanterns caught on us and we just wiped the whole thing out. I remember going over that table and looking down and old man Keller standing there with his mouth wide open, his eyes big as saucers. I think he thought it was the charge of the light brigade. I cherish that image. My dad and his gang brothers ragged, fierce Indian boys sailing over those picnic tables, looking down as astonished faces as their powerful steeds vaulted over the tables and pounded off into the night, trailing ribbons of gently lit Japanese lanterns from their shoulders. Not exactly the stereotypical image of the Indian warrior on horseback, but it'll do. That was powerful tricksing indeed. My dad was brilliant and loving and handsome. He was full of fun and laughter and jokes he could make people laugh. He also always carried anger toward his mom, feeling that she had abandoned them. When I asked him in 1983, Dad, what do you think about me trying to do an oral history of Shalako Indian School? The first thing he said was, that's a great idea. And a little while later, he said, be prepared 
to hear some hard stories. And I can give no better advice to anyone that interested in Indian boarding schools. These are important stories. Be prepared to learn some hard truths. As my dad aged, he lost memories and the story slipped away. Uh, up to his last year though, at age 93, my sister and I always knew what to get him for his birthday or for Christmas. He never lost his love for chocolate covered cherries all those years. And over all those years, my love and appreciation for his stories has only deepened. Our stories are important. Our stories are also complicated. Indian boarding schools were instruments of empire designed to eliminate the native. They were also crucibles that forged Indian identity, resilience, resistance, and commitment to our people's cultures and languages. I believe that my dad's stories and the stories of other Shalako alums are about a commitment to freedom. A freedom to be native on native terms, not anybody else's terms. Native stories state claims. Claims to freedom, claims to sovereignty, claims to self-determination, and the scariest claim of all, this is our land. It's really important to remember that Indian boarding schools were built to fulfill a larger federal agenda to dispossess native people of native lands. And that challenging issue, US claims to all that land, I suppose is another story for another day. I thank you for your kind attention today. And I believe we have time set aside for question and answers and comments. So I turn things back over to Rose. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tina. That was great to hear the stories about your dad and Bob. And um, really, I think you've given all of us a lot to think about. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can submit questions. Um, we have plenty of time today for questions. So on the control panel, which should appear on the right side of your screen, uh, there's a place to submit questions, and I'll be moderating those um, and asking um, Dr. Lomawema those questions. Uh, so we got just a couple that came in already while you were talking. Um, and I'll start with just a couple of um, pretty uh, simple questions about some of the content of the slides. Um, we had one person who was wondering, there was an earlier picture of students at Shilako that um, had an image that sort of looked like a swastika on the front of what they were wearing. And I was, they were wondering um, if you could tell us about what that means. Yeah, and actually, um, Rose, if you can put me back as presenter for a minute, I've got a slide that answers that question. Oh, sure. Yep. You, I think you are still the presenter. So go ahead and um, OK, change. let's see you, if this you works. Still have slide control. Ah, uh, Himmel, sorry. <laughs> now you know that my okay. other side of the family is German Mennonite. I thought I had a slide. Um, sorry about that. Uh, oh, no worries. there it is. There it is. OK, so that, can you see that now, the swastika? Yes. OK, so um, that. Um, image, that graphic, I should say, is something that's actually found throughout human history all around the world. The most mm -hmm. famous that most people are familiar with, of course, was the appropriation by Hitler and the Nazi party of what we now know as the swastika. But if you look on these images from Shilako, um, it's actually kind of turned a different way. So this is an, um, a graphic from, from native, from indigenous iconography that in um, the early 1920s was adopted as kind of the school uh, logo. And you can see here it was in cement on these pillars at the entrance to the superintendent's house. It was in um, mosaics on the school uh, floors. There were 
uh, Navajo designs. It's also a Navajo design, a uh, Navajo rugs that were used to um, uh, decorate the classrooms and so on. So that's where all of that comes from. Hmm, interesting. Well, thank you so much. Uh, great. So we have another question here uh, about just the research methodologies. You talk in this so much about the importance of stories. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why, what do the personal stories tell us that the records can't? Um, or why is it so important to have these personal stories as we all do to serve research on boarding school history? Well, the federal archives, I mean, they're remarkably rich. There's just a tremendous amount of information in them. But these stories of what it was actually life like, life was like in student uh, experience, um, it's very rarely there. There are occasional letters mm -hmm. uh, that have been preserved that were exchanged between students and their parents, um, but those uh, letters were often censored. Um, so I was actually just at the Fort Worth archives a couple of week, weeks ago and found a reference to um, the uh, Boy Scout camps that the uh, in the 1930s uh, that the boys were allowed to to create uh, Boy Scout troops and, and build these camps. And what I know from my dad's stories is that it was actually the gangs just moved straight. They, they let the boys make their own troops. So the gangs became the Boy Scout troops. And my dad's gang, those troublemakers, um, actually built this outdoor oven. They were supposed to learn how to cook outdoors and bake biscuits and whatnot. They actually um, kind of rigged up a very rudimentary still in theirs, um, not that it ever produced much, but um, you would never know that from school records. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Yeah, I think um, the person was sort of asking like what personal records do appear in the federal archives, and I think you kind of answered that by saying there, there isn't a ton that's actually produced by the students. Yeah, those letters though are, are an amazing treasure trove, and, and Brenda Child, who presented a webinar in this series earlier, she mm -hmm. devoted her whole book to um, experiences and stories from those letters. So they're not, they're not trivial, they're not insignificant, but they don't cover everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have another question about records. Um, I know Shalaka wasn't a church-run school, but this person is wondering if you have any suggestions for researching documents on a church-run boarding school. Um, I have not done that personally. I do know that, for example, the Presbyterian church which ran that mission school where La Flesh was at, was at, they have a historical society and, and archives. I believe it might be in Philadelphia, but for those mm -hmm. schools, you really need to, to contact those churches. They, they very often do have archives. And Oh, and Rose, we might also mention to people who are wondering about asking questions that the little thing to click on in the box says chat. Oh, yeah, you can, so there's a chat and there's a question, and you can feel free to submit oh, okay. questions either way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, absolutely, and I'll just follow up with the church-run uh, boarding school question, because this is something that we at NABS have struggled with, too, as we're working to locate the records. Um, another place to look if you're looking for Catholic records is the, Mar is the Marquette University Bureau of Indian Missions Collection. Um, mm -hmm. They have a very large collection of Catholic Indian boarding school records. Um, but we certainly struggle, too, with trying to locate those records, and that's one of our biggest challenges um, as we do this work. So, um, yeah. Uh, let's see here if we have other questions. Um, well, we have one question here just about um, the names of your dad and Bob. Um, somebody had noticed that they're Curtis Thorpe and Robert Carlyle, um, and wondering if those were names that were given to them at Shalaka, or if um, they were given those names prior to attending the school, or what the history around that is. Yeah, they were named by their parents. So um, my grandfather, whom my dad really does not remember, uh, abandoned the family quite early on. But mm. he claimed to have been a student at Carlisle. I have never found any record of his attendance there. Um, and in a, it, it's kind of an interesting side note, really, of how famous Carlisle was and how um, it was kind of a, often a badge of honor in Indian country um, to, to be able to claim that you were, had been a student at, at Carlisle. 
Um, all we really know about my grandfather was he apparently did not have a reputation for telling the truth. The Carlisle records seem to uh, um, substantiate that. But in any case, uh, he claimed to have been a student there at the same time as Jim Thorpe, the you know, probably most famous native athlete of all time. And so, yeah, both dad and, and Bob had those middle names. Oh, interesting. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And yeah, I think that's a story we've heard a lot from, from other people that sometimes attending these schools, particularly Carlisle, was sort of a badge of honor. Um, mm -hmm. We have another researcher who we've uh, worked with before, Llewellyn White, who tells a story about um, her relative saying that her great-grandfather played football with Jim Thorpe, and he was never there at the same time, you know, but it was it was a badge of honor to talk about that. And, um, she she tells a similar story in that sense. So yeah, as I recall, he Great. played the clarinet, not football. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I think you're right. Okay, um, let's see here. We have another question about this is a, a, also about research methods. Um, this person is saying that you mentioned while researching that one must prepare to hear the hard stories. How have you taken care of yourself as a person full of empathy for those survivors in your own hard times and while you're doing this research? Boy, that's that's really kind of a, a difficult question. Um, I would say it was really very, very challenging for me um, when I was, uh, so I had transcribed, you know, all these 60 interviews. So I had I'd something like 120, 140 hours of tapes to transcribe when I was done. It, and it took, frankly, almost two years. Um, and at the end of that, I felt like some of those stories were in my mind as real as if they were something I had lived myself. Um, and it just took some time to to kind of get a little uh, distance or perspective. Um, I think it took me actually quite a long time um, to begin to deal emotionally with these stories, um, especially my dad's stories, um, especially because. Um, well, I had, you know, I had mentioned that my dad uh, held a lot of anger towards his mom. And there was a point he reached in his life, gosh, it must have been, I think, 10 or 15 years after we did those interviews about Shalako. Um, and I think it was just part of his aging process where that anger really came out. And at that point in time, I, I really regretted ever doing this project. Um, all I can say is time went on and, and he and, and we as a family kind of worked through that. Um, but it, you know, it was really challenging at the time. Uh, so I, I think probably my answer, my short answer is I didn't deal very well or I didn't have very good mechanisms either for him or for me or for us as a family. Um, so I, I don't honestly know the best recommendation to make there other than to be more cognizant going in than I was going in, um, even though he had said that to me, right? Um, and, and maybe be a little more prepared up front if you're preparing to do these kind of interviews um, to even have like counseling backup uh, for both the person, you know, for all the people involved in telling these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for answering that. Um, it's a tough question for sure. Um, and I should mention that uh, the Boarding School Healing Coalition also has um, a, re a resource, list of trauma resources available on our website. It's not specific to research, to research but um, it is available if um, anybody feels like they could be useful even after viewing this episode. So please feel free to check that out. Um, we have another question here about just the field as a whole of American Indian boarding school scholarship. What do you think is missing in that field and where would you like to see it develop further? Oh boy. So, you know, when I started <laughs> out um, in the 1980s, gosh, it seems like just yesterday, there, there was only one really um, book of scholarship published. There were, there were personal accounts and memoirs by people like LaFleche and others. There was only one work of scholarship. Um, and, and that has expanded exponentially, which is wonderful. I mean, there's so much more work now and so many more people, but it's like anything in indigenous studies. There's so much work 
yet. I mean, there's so many what I call black holes that haven't even been touched yet. I mean, so many different schools that haven't been examined, both federal and mission. And then there's the day schools. And then there's people's experiences in public schools. Let's not pretend that's all been milk and roses. Um, and so, gosh, there's just so much to do. And then like Brenda's work, my work, many of us have focused on the early 20th century. So the latter half of the 20th century, barely touched. Um, it, I mean, it's really, I, so I can't really point out one thing or another. There's, there's just so much that is remaining to be done. Yes, I absolutely agree. There's a lot more to do. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Again, this is about research methodologies. Um, somebody's wondering if you've ever used Ancestry.com when gathering documents or information. I have heard of other researchers um, doing this, but I'm not sure if that's something that you've ever used in your methodologies. I no, I have to. I have to admit, I've not. It's something that um, actually I've just come to quite recently, and I'm, and I'm just about to start trying to figure out. Um, I, I think there's probably great potential there, but I haven't tapped it yet, which is, you know partly due to my age, right? So now people can see me and know that that picture you put up was kind of outdated. It's, it's all white up here now. Um, I mean, I'm not the most fluent person with online resources. So um, I'm, I'm sure there's people who can do that much better. All right, sounds good. Great. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have for right now. Uh, so I think we could wrap it up. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Lomawema, for your presentation. Um, this has been wonderful. And certainly, if anybody has other questions, please feel free to email us at info at nabshc.org, um, and we can pass those along to Dr. Lomawema. Um, just want to let everybody know that we will have um, one more episode in our part one of the series. Um, so this webinar series for 2019 has two parts. Um, next month, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Roberta Paul, and she's going to be giving a webinar about trauma and healing. Um, and she will be the final episode in our part one, and then we are going to take July off, and we'll resume with part two of the series in August. Um, and stay tuned for that schedule that's going to come out very shortly. Uh, so, yeah, please make sure to tune into our next episode on June 6th. Um, and feel free to send any feedback to that email. You'll get an email as well from GoToWebinar um, with the info email that you can send any feedback or additional questions to. So thanks so much, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. And I just also want to say thank you, Rose, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thanks so much.